Thank you, Theo, and thanks for the invitation, everyone. Um, so, yes, before before uh, maybe introducing the words in the, in the title, I'm, in this pre-seminar, I'm going to discuss some general things about polytubes and hyperplane arrangements that will be useful in the in the second part of the talk. So, this is a quick outline of what we will be discussing right now. Uh, so, let me start right away and well define. A polytube that I guess we're familiar with what it is. So a polytube is just a convex hull of finally many points in RT. Um, an important operation between polytubes is that of Mikowski sum. So the Mikowski sum of two polytubes P and Q is again a polytube. And as I said, it, it consists of all the points of the form A plus B, uh, where A is a point in the first polytube and B is a point in the second polytube. So geometrically, uh, how it looks like. So for example, here we're going to take the Mikowski sum of this trapezoid and this triangle. I could take the triangle or the second polytube in this case and take um, fix one of its points, maybe this, and, and try to put this point in every vertex of the other polytube. So for example, I can try to put the triangle over here and then over here and over here and here. So in the four vertices in this case, and takes the convex envelope of what I get. So when I take the convex envelope of this, I obtain something like this, which is precisely this um, hexagon that we have on the right. Okay, so that separation of Mikowski sum between polytubes. Uh, and of course, I can express this same hexagon in more than one way as a Mikowski sum. So this is one possible way to write as a Mikowski sum of two polytubes. Uh, and here's another way to write as a Mikowski sum of three segments. So see what happens if I take first the sum of this long segment and this diagonal, I obtain something that looks like this. So, the segment plus the diagonal, I obtain something like this. And when I take the sum of these with this other segment, well, I put the segment in all the vertices of the, of the parallel tip. Uh, and when I take the convex envelope, I get the same hexagon that we had before. So these expressions are not unique, um, but the operation is, is the same. Basically, we're taking pointwise addition of these, of these sets. Um, and I want to consider another way to write things down that it's uh, signed Mikowski sums. So I'm going to allow to move things around in a, an expression like this. When we say that these two sums are the same, I'm going to take the liberty to move things around and say, okay, maybe this trapezoid equals the sum of these segments minus this triangle. And the formal meaning of this will be uh, this polytube plus Mikowski sum plus the things that appear with a negative coefficient here equal the Mikowski sum of the things that appear with positive coefficients. So that's the formal statement. Uh, so not, not every sign Mikowski sum that I can write has meaning. Some of them won't represent a polytube. So for example, if you just take this difference right here, um, this doesn't represent any polytube because there's no polytope P such that P Mikowski sum with a simplex, a 2D simplex, uh, gives me a segment. Right, that is not possible. Whatever I have when I add p and the simplex will be bigger than the simplex. So I cannot, I cannot get a, a segment. Uh, and also, I want to point out that in this expression, I have labeled uh, these elements right here, because this picture, even though it looks two-dimensional, it's actually happening in R3, but it's happening in a hyperplane uh, where the sum of the coordinates is constant. So this one right here is the standard simplex. It has uh, vertices, the three, canonical basis vectors in R3. Um, and these over here are just some of the faces of the simplex actually. So this one right here is this face, uh, the face right here. And this simplex right here is this face. Uh, and this long segment, it has an additional two here because I'm taking the face right here. So the, the one uh, joining the first and second canonical basis vectors. And I laid in that segment by a factor of two. So this two right here just means dilated by a factor of two, uh, which is the same as taking the polytope and taking the Mikowski sum with itself. Okay, uh, So we're also going to be considering expressions like these that we, we're going to call them sign Mikowski sums. Okay, That was the first thing that I wanted to review. Uh, the second thing that I want to review is the formations. And for that, maybe I will introduce normal fans first. So let me set up some notation. Uh, given a polytope P, and any vector in RT that we're going to think of as a direction, I'm going to use this notation, so P sub D, to denote a certain phase of the polytope that I get in this in this way. So my vector V 
determines a direction, just a vector in RD. And I can consider hyperplanes that are perpendicular to this, um, to this vector. And as I move the hyperplanes in the direction of B, I'm going to be slicing P, uh, going to be intersecting P. And at some point, I'm going to intersect it for the last time. If I move my hyperplane just a little bit more in that direction, in the direction of P, the intersection becomes empty. So I'm going to take that last one, that last one such that the intersection is non empty. And the intersection of that hyperplane and the poly to P is what I'm going to denote with uh, P sub B. So it is a phase of the poly. Phases of a polytope are precisely sets that we can obtain in this manner. And here we have a different example. If I take a different vector, a different direction W, I do the same. I start slicing P with hyperplanes that are perpendicular to W. And when I take the last non-empty intersection, in this case, in this case, I obtain, I obtain a point. Uh, and this is just a phase of P, in this case, a vertex of P. Okay. And we're going to define the normal cone of a phase of the polytope P of a phase Q as this collection of directions. So the definition, uh, you, you can read it right here, but basically what it means is uh, all of these points in blue right here are going to form the normal cone of this phase. Uh, because if I take any vector in the interior of this blue cone, and I do this operation that we were describing before of maximizing in that direction, uh, the result will be this point, okay? But I'm going to consider the closed cone. So even if I take something in the boundary, like for example, this direction, uh, when I maximize in that direction, I'm going to get a possibly different phase, but a phase that contains the point that I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm going to consider these closed normal, normal cones. And finally, the normal fan of the polytope is the collection of all the normal cones across all of the phases of the polytope P. Okay, so this is a collection of polyhedral cones uh, it's a complete fan, so that means that every point in RD belongs to at least one of these cones. Um, and it's a fan, and that means that whenever I take two, uh, two cones and I take the intersection, the intersection is a common phase of both, of both cones, okay? And the collection is also closed and they're taking phases. So, for example, I have this uh, two-dimensional cone right here, and every phase of this cone, so for example, this ray, this ray or the center itself, uh, those, all of those are phases of this big cone and they are also in this collection of normal cones of the polytope P. Okay. Sorry, just to, so, the, this in, so this inequality in between polytopes is a phase or between cones is, a, is a, being a phase, right? No. Yes, yes, thanks. Yeah, I should clarify, yeah, this uh, less than or equal means that Q is a phase of P. Yeah. Um, okay, and this is the, one of, one of the possible definitions of a deformation. So all of the definitions are the same. They're just different ways of saying the same. Um, but I'm going to say that a polytope Q is a deformation of a polytope P if the normal fan of P refines the normal fan of Q. So let me show you what this means with a couple of examples. Uh, here I have this polytope P and its normal fan. So the normal fan consists of these five uh, one-dimensional cones, so just these rays the five two-dimensional cones in between these rays, so these two-dimensional cones, and the origin itself. So those are the cones of this fan, of the normal fan of P. And for example, what happens with this first one? What I did was taking this phase of P, and I have uh, pushed it a little bit in the direction of this arrow, uh, but without changing the, the direction of the edge. So I haven't changed the direction of the edge, but I have pushed it a little bit uh, and contracted. Uh, but the polytope that I get at the end it still has the same normal fine. So this, this is considered the formation of P. It has the same normal fine. And now I push it a little bit more uh, until it becomes a point. And when it becomes a point, the normal fine changes. Uh, we don't have the same normal fine. Uh, but it, this is still fine. This is a deformation because the property that we want is refines, uh, means that every cone in here in the normal fine of this polytope is the union of some cones in the normal fan of P. Okay, so the only one that didn't appear before is this two-dimensional cone right here, uh, but it's fine because that two-dimensional cone here is the union of these two two-dimensional cones in the normal fan of P. Okay, so this is still a deformation. Um, and similarly, we can start maybe 
pushing this edge uh, inwards until these two collapse and we get something like this. We get uh, just a, an edge, a, a line segment. This line segment right here is also the formation of P. Uh, the normal fan of this line segment has three cones. The first cone is this line. So not all of the cones need, need to have a, a point, uh, like an apex. In this case, the, the, the smallest cone is this line. Uh, but this line is the union of these two rays. So that's fine. This one satisfies that property. And the other cones that appear in the normal fan here are these two half spaces. Uh, but again, this left, sorry, this right half space is the union of these three cones right here. And the left half space is the union of these two cones right here. So this is still a formation. Sorry, this is still a coarsening, so the opposite of refining, a coarsening of the normal fan of P, which means this is still a deformation of P. Okay. And here's an example of something that is not a deformation. So if I have uh, this segment right here, it's normal fan. So just like this case, it has uh, this minimum cone. So this is the, the lowest, the, the smallest cone in the normal fan. Uh, but this cone, which in this case is just a line, is not the union of cones in the normal fan of P, right? Because this part, okay, is part of the normal fan of P, but there is no ray here that I can take the union with to get uh, this line. Okay, so this fails to, to satisfy this property. The, the normal fan here is not a refined, is not refined uh, by the normal fan of P. So this is not a deformation of P, okay? So I wanna point out that uh, in this particular example, this segment that I pick is basically this, this phase of P. So in general, phases of a polytope are not deformations of the polytope, okay? Uh, okay, and what, but one very nice property that normal fans and, and Mikoski sum satisfy is the following. Uh, if I take two polytopes P and Q, then the normal fan of their sum of P plus Q, the Mikoski sum of, of the polytopes, is the coarsest common refinement of the normal fans of P and Q, okay? What it means is uh, to obtain all of the cones in the normal fan of this polytope, I just take all possible intersections of a cone in here and a cone in here, okay? So for example, uh, this cone right here, this two-dimensional cone is the intersection of this cone here and this cone here, okay? Uh, or you, you, could, you could verify the same with, uh, with everyone. And it is possible to write every single cone in here as the intersection of someone here and here. So for example, this ray, right here at the intersection of, well, the ray itself uh, with this two dimensional phase, for example. So every, every cone here can be written as intersection of a cone here and a cone here. Okay, that's the coarsest common refinement. And because of this property, uh, we readily see that, for example, uh, P is a deformation of P plus Q, right? So a Mikoski summand, that's usually what we call this because this Mikoski sum with another polytope gives me this pentagon. We say that, uh, that this triangle is a Mikoski sum of this, uh, this pentagon. A Mikoski sum is always a deformation of the polytope, right? Because of this property precisely. Um, but it's also nice to check that if I fix a polytope P and I'm considering deformations of P, so I have two different deformations, Q and Q prime, uh, the, the Mikoski sum is also going to be a deformation of P, right? Because the normal fan of P refines the normal fan of Q and of Q prime. And the normal fan of the sum is the coarsest that still refines these two. So it's like a sort of like a least upper bound in, in a certain poset of ordering fans by refinement and, and something like that. So this is the, uh, yeah, this is the coarsest that refines these two. Uh, but the normal fan of P refines each one of them. So it also refines this one, okay? And actually, whenever the difference of Q and Q prime is defined, it's also going to be a deformation of P in this case, okay? So any, any questions about this? What is minus Q prime? Do you just change the direction? No, no, no. So the, these... Thanks for the question. This is not uh, reflecting Q prime and taking the Mikoski sum. 
it is not the same as that. Uh, this was that operation of, of sine Nikoski sums that we um, introduced before. So if this exists, that means that um, there is a polytope, let me call it R, such that the Mikoski sum of R and Q prime is Q. If such a polytope exists, then this is the same as R at that polytope, but it not always exists. Okay. Uh, uh, yep. Oh, I had a question about the kind of first example you gave where you expressed the um, uh, hexagon as the Mikoski sum of line segments. Yes. Um, does it like matter where you put the zero there? Yes. So yeah. So here, here, um, I'm not putting coordinates precisely because things are moving around, and I don't want to worry about that too much. But it is true. So if if we were to give coordinates, um, whatever. So it doesn't matter where the zero is, but this point, the coordinates of this point, are the sum of the coordinates of this point. Uh, let me see this point, and I suppose this point. Okay. So yeah. So the coordinates here are important, but I'm, I'm just not uh, being very careful here because later we're going to consider things modulo translation. But yes. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So, and quickly, uh, let me define a couple of uh, yeah, small definitions regarding hyperplane arrangements. So, we are working again over RD. So, we're considering hyperplane arrangements uh, that are linear. So that means these hyperplanes here are just could I mention one linear subspaces of RD, okay? And well, the first definition, kind of an important one is what's a flat of the arrangement. A flat of the arrangement is any subspace that I can obtain as arbitrary intersections of hyperplanes, okay? And this can go from R2 itself, which is the intersection of no hyperplanes. If I take the empty collection of hyperplanes and I intersect that, I obtain the ambient space, R2. Uh, it also contains each one of the hyperplanes, right? Because it's the intersection of just H, I, and that's it. Um, and also in this particular case, if I intersect any two of them, uh, I just get the, the zero vector. And in that case, that's another flat of the arrangement. And these are all in this example, okay? They form a poset and, uh, well, more than that, they form a lattice and, um, Usually you see them ordered by reverse inclusion, um, but that, that's not going to be very important right now. So I'm just going to leave it like this uh, because it's more consistent with the next picture that I'm going to show. Because the, the second thing that I want to define are phases of an arrangement. So now to get a phase of an arrangement, um, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to be intersecting things, but now let's be careful because for every hyperplane, I need to pick either the hyperplane itself or one of the two half spaces that the hyperplane defines, okay? Uh, so for example, I can take, uh, let me see, this side of H1, I could take maybe this side of H2, it doesn't look very good, okay. This side of H2 and this side of H3. And if I intersect these three half spaces, I obtain these cone waves here. So that's an example of a phase of an arrangement. Um, but if you look at the picture, it is what you what you would imagine. Think of this as the normal fine of something, and we already know what the normal cones are. Those are the phases of the arrangement. Okay, so in this particular example, we have uh, six full dimensional phases. Uh, we also have six rays. Again, they are here, and we also have this one that it's a phase of of everyone. Okay. Uh, okay, so I think I'm going a little bit over, uh, but let me let me finish with this. So we're gonna consider an additional structure on the on the phases of an arrangement. There's a way, a way to multiply the phases of an arrangement. Um, first, I can assign certain sign sequence to each phase just by saying, uh, yeah, by, by, um, by adding a negative sign if it's on the negative side of a hyperplane. So here I have added arrows to the node what's the positive half space for each of these hyperplanes. Um, and then on the first coordinate, I'm going to write a negative sign if the phase is on the, on the negative side of the first hyperplane, a positive sign if it's on the positive side, or a zero if it's contained in that hyperplane. So for example, this ray right here has this sign sequence, uh, minus zero minus, because it is on the negative side of H1. 
uh, it is contained in H2, so that's the zero, and it is on the negative side of H3. So it has this negative sign. And there is a way to multiply them uh, that we can define using the sign vectors. Uh, but maybe let me just give you a, a more geometric way to define the product. Um, and it is as follows. Um, this is not a commutative uh, product. So if I'm going to multiply this ray times this phase, I have to keep track of the order. And I'm going to pick a point in the interior of the first phase. So this one right here, a point in the interior of the second phase, so for example, this one. And I'm going to walk in a straight segment from, uh, from the first point to the second, but I'm only going to move a, a very small positive distance, okay? And when I move a very small positive distance, I'm going to be in a pot potentially in a different phase and that phase will be uh, the product of F times G, okay? We could describe this using signs, uh, but this is maybe more intuitive definition of what it means, okay? Uh, oops, how, how am I doing? Oh, no, it's okay with time. It's, it's, it's okay. very fine. You can talk until two more minutes if you want. Okay, so this, this is a, this is important and what uh, what this project is about, but it wouldn't be that important at least for for today's talk. Uh, yeah, we, we don't need to know too much of the properties of this monoid. But I just want you to know that this monoid is there uh, and it's not very hard to describe, and it's very interesting. It captures a lot of the combinatorics of the of the arrangement. Uh, and the last thing that I want to introduce are a sonotope or the sonotope of a hyperplane arrangement. So a sonotope. Uh, is a polytope that can be written as the Mikowski sum of segments. Okay, that's the definition of a sonotope. And if I have a hyperplane arrangement, A, what I'm going to do is take a segment orthogonal to each one of the hyperplanes of the arrangement. And then when I take the Mikowski sum, I get a, a sonotope. So just like in this picture, I have chosen uh, one segment for each hyperplane of this arrangement, taking the, the sum and we get a, po uh, yeah, a polytope, a sonotope. Um, and because of the properties that we discussed before, that the normal fan of a sum is the coarsest common refinement and, and all of these, uh, we actually check two nice properties. The, the first one is that the normal fan of the sonotope is precisely the collection of faces of the arrangement. Okay, so it's, it's very easy to see that yeah, uh, the faces of the arrangement correspond to normal cones of the faces of the sonotope. Um, and the second, property that sonotopes have is that all of the faces of the sonotope are the formations of the sonotope. So we have just seen in the previous example that that was not true in general. You can have polytopes such that one of its faces is not a deformation of the polytope itself, uh, but with sonotopes that doesn't happen. Every face is a deformation of the sonotope. Okay. Um, and here is a, a picture that we'll go back to. Uh, this is a very particular sonotope that we will be interested about uh, for this particular hyperplane arrangement. Uh, but we will come back to this in the second half of the talk. So far, do you have any questions? Well, let's thank Jose for the pre-seminar. Thank you very much, Jose. It was really nice. Thanks. Uh, yeah, do you have any questions for Jose? So if you have a hyperplane um, and then you are deciding which side of the hyperplane is plus, which is minus, is that just arbitrary? Yes, yes, it's arbitrary. But once I pick them, I, I can assign signs to every face consistent to the, the choice that I make at the beginning. Yeah, it is arbitrary, but fixed. Yeah. Usually, what sometimes you can do is, is actually uh, pick a special chamber, so a maximal phase of the arrangement, and, um, and agree that that one is contained on the positive half side of all of the hyperplanes. So for example, I, I'm gonna declare that this phase uh, is on the positive side of all hyperplanes, and that determines that, okay, then this is the positive side of H1, this is the positive side of H2, and this is the positive side of H3. And so I also wanted to ask when you describe the monoid operation. So I think I was more familiar with seeing something that looks a little bit opposite where the product is the last phase that you get before you reach the second part. 
is that equivalent with with your version just doing the the other way around the multiplication being the other way around no no it's it's different um so oh. maybe what you're thinking about or if i understand correctly maybe what you're thinking about is uh here here i'm just talking about linear hyperplanes um but something that is very interesting is what happens if you have a linear hyperplane so just like this one so let me not draw it again so a linear hyperplane like the one you see right here uh, and a deformation of this what what is a deformation it is a hyperplane arrangement whose hyperplanes are parallel to these ones okay but now not necessarily linear so for example i have something like this and like this and maybe this okay then uh, there is a module structure so first of all the faces here have a monoid structure the same one that we just described but also there is a um, there is a module structure of the faces here as a module over the faces here and there is actually two one on one as a right module and one as a left module uh, so i don't remember which one is which right now but one of the descriptions is uh, a face here determines certain direction. One of the products is walk in that direction until you reach the first phase. And the other one is walk in that direction until you reach the last phase. Uh, so I, I think the first phase is the action on the right, and I'll, the last phase is an action on the left. Uh, but yeah, I said there are different structures. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the, the xenotopes. Um, are there any other like characterizations of xenotopes? Like if you look at a polyhedron, can you tell whether it's a xenotope? Or do you have to like compute the, the, the normal fan and the faces and things? Um, I mean, this, this is sort of a characterization, roughly. Um, the, the, so we, we saw before how if you have a Mikowski summon, a Mikowski summon of a polytope is always a deformation of that polytope, right? Here, we're just saying that the faces of, of a sonotope are deformations, but it's even stronger. The faces of the sonotope are Mikowski summons of the sonotope. Right? And that, that completely characterizes sonotopes. Um, so for example, I could, I could move this a little bit, and this is no longer a sonotope, uh, but it's almost a sonotope. This polytope still satisfies that every face is a deformation of, of, of the polytope itself, okay? Uh, but it is not a sonotope anymore. But the property of every face being a Mikowski summon, that one determines sonotopes. Um, yes, but it, it is not, it is not a, a, an efficient way to find out if something is a sonotope um, like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what an efficient way would be. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Thank you. Probably, probably, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is true, but I think this is necessary. Uh, if you look at all the edge edges, all the ed edges that appear, uh, every edge that is parallel to another ha has to have the same length. And I think that might be enough. 